welcome to History for Granite. Join me to explore ancient Egypt. Together, we'll uncover secrets that only stones from antiquity can reveal. Please subscribe to the channel to show your support for this line of inquiry. That drives me to make more of this content for you. Every so often, an artistic reconstruction of the Giza pyramids comes across my feed, and I must admit they give me mixed feelings. On one hand, I love the depictions of the pyramids clad in their original polished white limestone casing. The general public is largely unaware that the pyramids looked so different and were so glamorous in the ancient past. It can be difficult to believe that almost every last limestone casing block was dislodged and hauled away in the last several hundred years. On the other hand, the depictions of enormous golden capstones are a bit cringeworthy because it is extremely unlikely that any large pyramid possessed such a feature. But let's start with the beautiful Tura limestone. The only large pyramid to retain a significant portion of its white casing stones today is the Bent Pyramid. The weathering of wind, rain, and pollution has removed their glistening polish but conceivably they could be restored to their former glory if enough tourist dollars incentivized it. The Bent Pyramid has retained most of its original casing stones due to a combination of factors that made it less appealing to looters. Probably the most significant reason is that the Bent Pyramid was built with most of its casing stones tilted slightly upwards. This made each block more difficult to dislodge by quarrymen. But most importantly, the blocks did not loosen or break as frequently because its design was resistant to thermal expansion. Thermal expansion occurs when the heat of the sun hits the limestone and causes it to swell in size a modest amount. If the masonry has no gaps in the joints, the only space available for the stone to expand is outwards, towards the edge of the pyramid. Eventually, the stone is nudged enough askew that the weight from above causes it to crack or simply fall off. The Bent Pyramid mitigated this because its joints aren't razor thin, and this allowed each individual stone to expand and contract without being forced away from the pyramid. Furthermore, their slight inclination inward would help resist this outward pressure. In contrast, the Great Pyramid, with its ultimate precision and flat courses, would have had its casing stones loosened by thermal expansion because each block had no room to breathe without being forced outward. Peter James is a structural engineer and managing director at Syntec International and has led a project charged with preserving the pyramids. His 2018 book, Saving the Pyramids, discusses in great detail how the outer layer of limestone would fail over time. He attributes thermal expansion as a primary reason casing stones would snap off the large pyramids of the 4th dynasty. Of course, loose and fallen blocks are much easier to quarry away, and so perhaps the stripping of the Great Pyramid wasn't quite as big of a job as it might initially seem. One additional attribute that made the Bent Pyramid casing stones less appealing to looters is that they just aren't as well cut as what you see in the other true angular pyramids. Generally, the stones are smaller, with many more patches and irregular shapes that require greater effort to rework. Thus, the prize just wasn't worth the effort, and so today we all get to benefit from this happy accident of history that so many stones were spared. The preservation of casing stones at the top of Khafre's pyramid is probably the result of another accident of history, although this one might have resulted in the death of anyone near the structure at the time. You'll notice that the masonry below the intact upper layer of casing looks even, well-dressed, and squarely joined. In contrast, beneath this level, the stones look frightfully messy and irregular. This is because Khafre's pyramid used a very rough and sloppy fill layer between the white casing stones and the more solid inner structure. This fill layer is completely missing in the middle here, and this is likely due to a sudden collapse of the loose fill on all sides. This would have been a tremendously destructive event, and no doubt contributed to the disarray of stone courses below. With the remaining white casing stones marooned at the summit, nobody was willing to risk their life attempting to quarry them off it. Even less fortunate were the capstones of pyramids, referred to by the term pyramidions. 
Their precarious location made them the most vulnerable stone of each monument, and it's no wonder that so little evidence of them remains today. There is a poorly executed reconstruction of one that allegedly belonged to the Red Pyramid, but the angle of inclination of its faces does not match that of the pyramid itself. The difference between them is about 10 degrees. This detail alone seems prohibitive of giving the fragments such an attribution. Instead, it's a very close match to the steeper inclination angle of the neighboring Bent Pyramid. But then why might it be found near the Red Pyramid instead? Perhaps, like the Bent Pyramid, the original angle of inclination for the Red Pyramid was 10 degrees steeper. It's very easy to go down a rabbit hole of speculating which pyramid came first and why their slopes differ. But nevertheless, the reconstructed pyramidion offers more questions than it does answers. Probably the best example for evaluating Old Kingdom pyramidions is the surviving portion of one that belonged to a satellite pyramid at Giza. It is notably undecorated and small, similar in size and composition to every other white limestone block you would find at the top of a pyramid. The most interesting feature about it is completely obscured in this exhibit, and that is that the bottom surface protrudes in a convex shape so that it would fit into a concave recess within the stones below it. Therefore, the pyramidion would have some lateral support and not be easily displaced by the weathering forces of nature. So then, where do people get the idea of enormous gilded pyramidions, sometimes even possessing hieroglyphic inscriptions? The examples come from pyramidions that came many centuries later, such as the possible capstone of the Black Pyramid of Amenemhat III. They combine this with a tiny chapel pyramidion from another thousand years later that has traces of gilding on the surface. You can put these two examples together and let your imagination run wild. Now, I fully admit that having contrast between a pyramid and its pyramidion can look striking. Take the modern example of the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas as a good implementation. But what these reconstructions fail to take into account is that we can be certain the large pyramids of Giza didn't have enormous pyramidions because Khafre's is only missing the top 7 meters at the summit. Even if the pyramidion was the entire missing portion, it would appear quite small from the ground. The Great Pyramid is missing much more masonry at the summit, but it seems quite unlikely that the second pyramid of Khafre would fail to imitate such a prominent feature. Everything else about Khafre's pyramid is an attempt to outdo the Great Pyramid. It's built on higher ground so as to have a taller peak, the angle of inclination is slightly steeper, and the bottom course of this pyramid was originally cased in granite instead of white limestone. But the main reason for me why the 4th Dynasty pharaohs wouldn't gild their pyramidians is that the glare from the white limestone would completely obscure the golden portion. The pyramids were designed to be embodiments of the sun, and their polished white surfaces would have been blindingly bright in the daytime. It would have been difficult to stare at them for long, and probably impossible to see a small golden peak against the glare and reflection created by the entire structure. This means that a more accurate representation of what the pyramid would look like to the human eye is this photo with the glare added. Also remember that the viewing perspective of the ancient Egyptians would have been looking up at the pyramids from below. This makes the vanishing point of the summit that much harder to discern with the naked eye. The most important concept to understand for making a pyramidion stand out is that of contrast. This is why all the evidence for pyramidians or obelisk tips having a reflective gold or copper surface is when they are made of dark granite. This way, the shiny and reflective tips really stand out and add visual flair. It doesn't make sense to add a small shiny peak to an enormous monument that is already white and reflective. If you were going to make the pyramidion of Khafre or Khufu's pyramids stand out, you probably would choose a dark granite or basalt that would give some contrast from the ocean of white limestone below. There would also be the additional benefit of the harder material resisting erosion from rain and wind. This is probably why the much later pyramid of Amenemhat III used a dark granite pyramidion. 
His pyramid is nicknamed the Black Pyramid, but it too was originally cased in white limestone. Thus, the capstone would have contrasted the rest of the monument quite nicely. Did the tradition of using dark pyramidians stretch all the way back to the Great Pyramids of the Fourth Dynasty? We may never know the answer for sure, but we can be confident that the contrast would have at least made sense from a visual perspective. Thanks to everyone who watched this video to the end. Please subscribe to the channel to see more of this content. Give a like or comment as you see fit. And above all, remember to ask your friends if they take their history for granted.